Hey, good afternoon, Refuge family. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, today is October the 13th. Here we are, midway through October, um, and looking forward to hopefully the weather cooling down in the next couple weeks. I know here pretty soon it's going to be warming up quite a bit, and um, I wasn't really happy to know that, that we're going to be kind of experiencing some warm weather in the coming days. I can't wait for it to cool down and for us to throw the sweatshirts on and just kind of enjoy some of the fall weather as we get into the holiday season together. Um, today, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about uh, the, the power of story and the power of parables, because we know that that is one of the main ways that Jesus taught. And so, I'm going to have you go to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses uh, 10 through 12 today. So Mark chapter 4, 10 through 12, and we're going to talk about the power of story or the power of parables. Let's go ahead and pray as we get into the Word. Father, we thank you for today. I thank you for everybody who is listening today, who's watching on the other side, uh, there in their home or at work or wherever it is that they are. I pray that the next few moments will be encouraging, uh, will be strengthening, uh, and will be powerful to them. In your name, amen. So, talking about the idea of parables or the idea of story, and why is story so powerful? Well, I wanted to start with a parable that's not found in the Bible. It's a, it's a classic parable, I guess, or classic story. Uh, and it goes like this. It says, you know, once upon a time, there was a scorpion and there was a frog. And the frog was on the side of the river bank, and the scorpion came up to the frog. The scorpion talked to the frog and said, Mr. Frog, will you give me a ride across the river so I can get to the other side? And the frog looked at the scorpion and said, I can't do that, Mr. Scorpion, because if I give you a ride across the river, as soon as you get on my back, you're going to sting me. And the scorpion looked at the frog and said, I promise I won't sting you. I won't do that as we go across the river because it won't be safe for us. I promise, Mr. Frog, I will not sting you. So the frog looked at the scorpion. He thought about it. And he said, okay, go ahead and climb on my back and I will give you a ride across the river. So the scorpion climbs on the frog's back. It they then begin to swim across the river together. And as they get midway through across the river, the frog feels a little sting on its back. And it talks to the scorpion and it says, Mr. Scorpion, why did you sting me? Now we're both going to drown in this river. And the scorpion looks at the frog and says, I couldn't help myself. I'm a scorpion and that's just what I do. And then they both drowned. And it's a very sad parable. It's a very sad story. Um, but as you look, it's a classic parable. It's supposed to teach the point of this, is that sometimes vicious people uh, will just act viciously or will act mean, even if it's harmful to themselves in relationship with another individual, because that's just the nature of who they are. Now, that parable is not found in the Bible. But Little stories like that, parables like that, are really powerful. And the reason why they're powerful is because it engages you in a story and it puts you in a framework of thinking where you have to use your own mind to kind of figure out and draw out the purpose of the story. And in that exploration of what is this story about, there's actually a deep learning that takes place. And Jesus uses this form of teaching all the time. And he actually even explains this point to his disciples in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 10. And it says this, I'll read it. It says, But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those on the outside, all things come in parables. And then he quotes from the Old Testament. He says this, So that, the saying that is written by the prophet Isaiah in verse 12 says this, So that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear, but they may not gain understanding, least 
they turn from their ways and their sins be forgiven of them. So Jesus is kind of setting out for his disciples and he's explaining to them that I am going to explain to you what all of these stories mean. I'm going to give you a clear understanding of, of these parables. But to those people who are on the outside, those that don't get the full explanation from me, everything comes in story form. And I believe what Jesus is trying to point out here by quoting from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 12 is this, when he says that seeing they may see but not perceive, they may hear but they may not have understanding, is that when you tell a parable or when you tell a story, it's a way of separating out two different groups of people. Is that when you tell a story and you ask people to reach for the understanding, to strive to understand what the point of the parable is, is that there will be people that will just come along to hear a really good story. But there will be those that really want to seek out and they really want to learn and they really want to gain a deeper understanding of truth and they really want to search for that truth. And the separation between those two different groups of people, I think, is a way of revealing the heart that is inside an individual. And so Jesus would use parables, and it says, if you continue reading in Mark chapter 4, and then you go to verse 33, it says this, And with many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. So Jesus used this as a separating tool, and he used it often. And there are probably many parables that weren't written down that Jesus taught about. But it's that idea of separation, that idea of, of God looking for the people that are earnestly seeking him, honestly looking for him in life. God's looking for those that are looking for him. So the challenge for today, or the thought for today, is this. Is that as you go about your day-to-day -day life in your home, with your family, or in your office, or wherever it is that you spend the majority of your time throughout the course of the day, are you looking for God? Are you seeking God in this life? in everything that is around you, in all encounters that you come across with other people, are you actually having God as the first thing on your mind? And are you looking for those things that point to Him? Or have you become kind of numb? And have you just kind of gotten to the rhythm and the pattern of just doing life and just kind of going by your day-to-day and you're waking up, you're doing your routine, you're going to work, you're doing whatever it is, and then you return back home and you just go through this pattern again and again and again, and you just kind of, you don't feel like God is around you. Are you looking for Him? Because He's <laughs> omnipresent. He's everywhere. God is here. God is with you. God is with me. It doesn't matter where you're at. God is there. But the question is, are you looking for Him? If your day-to-day -day life was like a parable that God put in front of you, a chance for you to find Him, to explore His Word and look for His truth, are you actually doing that? And are you growing in that deeper understanding of who He is, or what we like to say in the family ministries here, is are you growing in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that the Spirit brings? To back up this idea that God uses story, that God uses parable, that God is looking for people who are looking for him. I love this proverb right here. It's Proverbs chapter 25 verse 2, and it says this. It says, it is the glory, the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is the honor, or your versions might say the glory of kings to search a matter out. It is wonderful to constantly be looking for God, to be looking for those God moments, to be looking for those moments where God is saying, oh, I'm revealing myself to you constantly, but are you even aware of it? Or are you blind to it? Are you blind by your bitterness? Are you blind by your rage? Are you blind 
by your anger? Are you distracted by all the temporary things of this world that are pulling your attention away from actually looking deeper into all the things that I have placed around you so that you may explore me and understand the fullness of who God is. I pray for you today as you go forward um, you know, from this little time listening to this, is that you take some time and you do some reflection and you do some thinking and start thinking about where are the places that God has been revealing himself to you? Write them down if you need to be. Write those things down, think about them, dwell on them, and start looking for those moments where you can see that God is working in your life in so many different ways. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I thank you so much um, for today. I thank you, Lord, that in this life that we live and that we lead, that you are ever-present, Father. You have revealed yourself through your creation, as your word would speak to us. You have shown yourself, you have made yourself known in the person of Jesus Christ, Father. Um, and I pray that for everybody who is listening, that as they go from here, that they do not stop looking for you actually working in their life every single day. And they don't turn a blind eye or are like those people that just hear a story or have a moment and walk away and move on. But they actually start to reflect on the things and the lessons of life that you have taught them. And they start to see where you have been working. In your name, amen.